For our second video in chapter seven, we are going to talk about a really important new idea called an electronegativity, um, and then transition into Lewis symbols. Both of those are building the foundation for video three, where we'll introduce Lewis structures, which are a critical idea from chapter seven that we'll continue to use throughout your time in chemistry. Okay. I mentioned electronegativity before, and we need to have that idea to differentiate between the two types of covalent bonds. Okay. We've talked in the first video about the difference between a covalent and an ionic bond. Okay. And while we know that a covalent bond means electrons are being shared, we can break it down even further into two different types of covalent bond. Okay. A pure covalent bond, which is also known as a nonpolar covalent bond, and a polar covalent bond. And the difference between those two is how the electrons are being shared. Okay. If electrons are being equally shared, okay, they spend their time about equidistant between the two nuclei. And that is where we have a nonpolar or a pure covalent bond. Okay. So anything that's diatomic, right, homonuclear diatomic, meaning it's the same atom in the bond, those are always a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay. But if we have something that's heteronuclear, meaning the two nuclei in the bond are different, okay, there's a chance there it could still be nonpolar, but it could also be a polar covalent bond which is where we have an unequal sharing of electrons, right? And the pair of electrons that are shared in that bond are shifted closer to one of the two atoms. Okay? And we can determine if something is polar or nonpolar, and if it is polar, where the electrons are spending more time closer to by looking at differences in electronegativity for the atoms that are involved in the bond. Um, and electronegativity, also abbreviated as capital EN, right, is a measure of the tendency of atoms to attract electrons, saying it a different way, electron density, right? Basically, everything that that bond is made up of toward itself. And, and this is something we're always thinking is possible. It's not guaranteed, but it's possible when two atoms in a covalent bond are different. Yep because it determines how those shared electrons are distributed. Whichever thing in the bond is more electronegative is where the elements will, or sorry, the electrons will spend time closer to. Think about whatever is more electronegative as kind of being the bully, it's pulling the electrons away in that tug of war. Um, electronegativity, right, is a relative value. Everything on the periodic table has a relative value of electronegativity, it's a unitless quantity, and these, values were developed by this guy right here, Linus Pauling. Okay. And the overall trend in the periodic table, right, is electronegativity increases from left to right, and it decreases from top to bottom. So if we're looking at an overall trend, it increases going to the top right, similar to electron affinity, or first ionization energy. Things become more electronegative as we go to the top right, excluding the noble gases. So fluorine, if you're looking at the periodic table, is the most electronegative element. So what does that do if we look at an electron heat map? Right? Looking at Cl2 over here, this is the thing that's nonpolar. Right? The electrons are shared equally. Right? There's no hot spot in the molecule. But over here with HCl, the electrons aren't shared equally. Chlorine is more electronegative than is hydrogen. The electrons are spending more time closer to chlorine, okay, so that's notice the hot spot over here in red. Okay, so polar over here, nonpolar on the left. Okay, and then this table here just shows the overall trend for electronegativity, right? Increasing, going up and to the right. Notice fluorine with a value of four right there is the highest, and our noble gases are excluded. So how does that tie back into pure or nonpolar? sorry, pure or polar covalent bonds. Something that's pure, aka nonpolar, electrons are shared. Okay. That will be shared when we have either the same electronegativity value or very similar electronegativity values. Okay. So where do we commonly see it? We mentioned this already, homonuclear diatomics, right? If the two things in the bond are the same, it's guaranteed to be pure covalent. Another one that's going to, we're commonly going to see 
where it's a pure covalent bond is a carbon hydrogen bond. Any carbon hydrogen bond is a pure nonpolar covalent bond. Yep. And that's something you'll want to know because you don't need to memorize these electronegativity values. If the things are the same in the bond, it's nonpolar. If it's carbon and hydrogen, it's nonpolar. What about the polar things? Okay, this is where we have the unequal sharing of electrons. Okay, this is where we've got notably different electronegativity values. They can't be totally opposite sides of the spectrum because if the electronegativity values get too different, then the electron will be transferred completely and we go back to being an ionic bond. Okay? But these intermediate differences in electronegativity, okay, the higher the difference in electronegativity values, the more, the more polar something becomes. Okay? And that polar bond is a dipole. Wherever the electrons are spending time closer to, that thing gets a partial negative charge, which we represent with a delta negative. It's not a full negative, just partial. Right? It's not ionic. And the thing where the electrons are spending time further away from gets a partial positive charge. Right, because it's electron poor. Those electrons have moved somewhere else. Partial positive, delta positive. Okay, so you do need to know how to indicate this. If you've identified a polar bond, you need to also be able to show delta positive and delta negative. That's what's shown on this slide right here, right? HCl. Chlorine is more electronegative. It gets the delta negative. Hydrogen right, is less electronegative. It gets the delta positive. This is a nice slide tucked into the middle here to tie chapters six and seven together. Okay, it's showing all of your trends, atomic radius, ionization energy, okay, electronegativity, also metallic character. That's one that we didn't discuss. Uh, but it, this slide is talking about the difference between electronegativity and electron affinity. Because while they have the same trend on the periodic table, they don't mean the same thing. Right? You can actually measure electron affinity in the lab. It's a measurable physical quantity. Right? You can measure, is it endothermic or exothermic? But I mentioned before, electronegativity, dimensionless quantity. It's just describing trends, how tightly an atom is going to attract electrons when it's in a covalent bond. Yep. Nice slide here, number 28 as well, right? If there's no electronegativity difference, it's pure covalent, aka nonpolar, right? In the middle, we were just talking about, that's a polar covalent, and too large, as I mentioned before, that becomes ionic. We can actually put some numbers behind these things. These are rough approximations, yeah, because there are a lot of exceptions here, and this is not a table you need to memorize, but it's kind of a guide to help you out when you're in doubt. If the electronegativity difference, looking back at that previous periodic table that had all the values, is less than 0.4, that's something that's nonpolar, pure covalent. So like our carbon hydrogen, they don't have the exact same value, but it's less than 0.4. Polar covalent is between 0.4 and 1.8, and if we get greater than 1.8 in our difference in electronegativity, then we're fully transferring electrons we've become ionic again. What about polyatomic ions? These are kind of a weird thing, okay? Because a polyatomic ion has both covalent bonds and ionic bonds. Look at this structure right here. Now, this is what we're getting to later in the chapter. It's kind of a modified Lewis structure. It's missing some things. But this is looking at the structure of potassium nitrate. And there is a ionic bond between potassium, K plus, and nitrate, NO3 minus. There's an ionic bond between these two, but yet within nitrate itself, there are polar covalent bonds as well. So that's one special thing to look out for, okay? polyatomic ions, because the thing within the ion themselves, these atoms are held together by polar covalent bonds. But the overall salt of the polyatomic ion is opposite charges, right? So those are held together by ionic bonds. So a polyatomic salt has both polar and ionic bonds, which you'll see some in your sapling. And that brings us, right, looking at this structure here, to 
Lewis symbols, and then in our next video, Lewis structures. As we talked about in the first video from this chapter and in chapter six as well, and when we're forming chemical bonds, we are sharing or transferring valence electrons. So we use Lewis symbols as a convenient way to show valence electron configurations. So if I think about boron, right? It's the highest principal quantum number. So it's just the n equal two that are my valence electrons. Over here, carbon. Over here for nitrogen, right? So they have three, four, and five valence electrons, respectively. So when I am making a Lewis symbol, okay, the way that I do that is I write the elemental symbol, right? B for boron, C for carbon, N for nitrogen right from the periodic table. And then I surround it with dots. But the order of drawing the dots is important. Before you start to pair anything up, you show a dot on each side of the ion, right? So this table here is showing us everything in row three. All right, so one valence electron, two, and we max out with our Lewis symbols with eight valence electrons. So this is a nice figure from your textbook, figure 17, or sorry, 7.9. And so if I'm drawing a Lewis symbol, all right, how do I do it? I, I pick whatever I'm dealing with. Let's take, uh, this already has chlorine on it, so let's show fluorine, for example. Yeah. And I show a dot on each side. Remember the trick from chapter six, it's the last digit of the group number, it tells you how many valence electrons you have. So fluorine is in group 17, it has seven valence electrons. And it doesn't matter where you start, top, right, bottom, left, I usually start on the top or the left, but you can choose anyone. And we need to fill in seven dots, but the order of doing it is important. Okay, one on each side, so one, two, three, four, before I start pairing them up. So I go one, two, three, four, then five, six, seven. Okay. And notice it's two pairs, or sorry, pairs of two on each side. Four sides, you max out at eight electrons. For fluorine here, we're done because it only has seven. Okay, so should, hopefully that makes sense from looking at this table. Okay, you can consult your textbook as well. Anything that's isoelectronic with these, right, above or below in the same column would have the same valence electron configuration. We can do Lewis symbols for ions as well. So what does that look like? If we're trying to do ions, one second while I get rid of that fluorine, there we are. Lewis symbols for ions, this is where we'll finish this video. Yep, sodium and chlorine, right? We just saw fluorine, which is the same as chlorine, seven dots. Sodium only has one valence electron, so it gets one dot. Okay. So how do I show the Lewis symbol for an ion? Well, I just either add if it's a cation, or get, sorry, add if it's an anion, or get rid of if it's a cation, the appropriate number of electrons. So sodium went from neutral with one valence electron to Na plus with no valence electrons, right? It lost its one valence electron. So it now has no dots, but I have to include a plus over here to show properly that I didn't make a mistake, I didn't forget a dot, I know that it's Na plus. And Cl went from being neutral with seven valence electrons to Cl minus with eight valence electrons. Right? There's that extra one that it gained right here. And to indicate that difference, right, I put it in brackets and put a minus outside of that. And the textbook didn't do it on this slide, but it's really good practice to get in the habit of doing that every time. So a better way to show that right, would be to have brackets for sodium and then the plus outside. Oh, it's a good habit to be in to always include your ions with brackets to indicate to whoever's reading that you mean for it to be an ion. Okay? And then when you're showing the Lewis structure of the ionic compound together, right, you just put those two individual Lewis structures next to one another. 
right? So that would just look If you're doing these two together, right, it would just be the Na in the Cl next to one another. And that would be okay, not including the charges, because we know that they have to cancel one another out to be neutral overall. But if you showed the charge on each of them, that's fine too. So that's looking at Lewis structures for ionic compounds. It's just putting the Lewis symbols together. Those are a piece of cake. In the next video, we'll talk about Lewis structures for covalent bonds, which are a little bit more involved and have some rules to follow. But make sure you're comfortable with doing all these types of Lewis structures because these are the bread and butter of this chapter.